Magnavox presents Odyssey, the electronic game of the future. Odyssey easily attaches to any brand TV, black and white or color, to create a closed circuit electronic playground. Odyssey gives you all the exciting action of hockey and 11 other challenging play and learning games for the entire family. Odyssey, a new dimension for your television. Now at your Magnavox dealer. He's listed in the yellow pages. <laughs> uh, yes, Half Glass Gaming. Welcome to the other episode. Um, I am the moderator. Uh, my name is Julian Watkins. I'm joined by the uh, collection of uh, inquisitive minds and uh, brave souls, otherwise known as Mandy. Hey! The Rev. Howdy. And just Josh. Just Josh. We're here with um, an episode. You know, I sort of feel like we should go out with a huge bang for our last episode, but apparently that's how Josh came into the world this morning with a mm. huge bang, so... Yeah, to pick up the uh, the dangling plot thread of things that happen outside of Josh's window. <laughs> um, Previously outside Josh's window. <laughs> That's pee on that guy's pee! Right! <laughs> <laughs> it was like five or six in the morning and a like the power line transformer exploded right outside of my window. I didn't know what it was because I've never seen that happen in real life before. Mm-hmm. And you know, in the uh, in the movies, they just go, pew, pew, pew. but like it makes this weird science fiction sound effect, and it's like a, bwah, bwah. and then like all this light was flashing outside my window, and I was like, "What is going on?" And then I, I realized there was no power, and so I kind of put two and two together, and then I went on my phone and I watched a YouTube video of a transformer <laughs> exploding. Not a Michael DeBay transformer, like a power line <laughs> transformer, and uh, it sounded exactly like the thing that happened outside of my window. And then I actually went outside, and there was a, a dude from uh, XL Energy came to fix it. He was up in his little basket. It's cherry picker. Picking them it, cherries. It's nice that they got on it really quick. Can't afford not to these days, I tell you. Yeah, it was like an hour well, like an hour and a half, and it was fixed. It happened um, in my building. I was walking the dogs early in the morning. It was dark out still, and I it felt as if it got darker, you know, but I wasn't paying attention to whether or not any of the streetlights were on and none of them seemed to be. So I was like, oh, well, okay, I'm, I must just be still half asleep and uh, got back in. And sure enough, like parts of the building were was powered up and other parts weren't. The hallway lights were <laughs> off, but, you know, the emergency light was on. But in the apartment, all the kitchen appliances were off, but some of the lights still worked. I mean, it was just very peculiar. So, night before last, my partner ran the blender, and it proceeded to blow out three of the outlets. The breakers weren't flipped. It's, you know, a reasonably new apartment building. Do you have, uh, like, the test reset outlets? The ones that you just push the button with? Yeah, yeah. we do. And it nothing. No idea why or how that happened. Huh. And also, multiple times throughout the day and night, it sounds like there's gunshots not too far away. It happens too often for it to actually be gunshots, so it, it can't be that. So you're a little a little too far south in in Minneapolis to be hearing gunfire. If you're north side, it'd be gunfire, but yeah, no, we're south. <laughs> I mean, even north of like Lake, when I was living in that neighborhood, we would bring up the crime map of the the neighborhood, and like our side of Lake would be fine, and then you would look at the other one, and they would have like a little red M for like whenever there's a murder, and you know, I think this data was the past like 48. hours hours of the past week and there would be just like red M's all over. It's like, holy shit. Holy shit indeed. Now, Why are you now, looking at me when you're talking about people being murdered? It's yeah. basically uncomfortable. That's the natural transition. Yeah, no, now you're people supposed to talk Danny. about... We'll start with them. <laughs> now you're supposed to talk about crime and loud noises in your experience. That's how these things go. <laughs> I used to live in the middle of nowhere. There were a lot of foxes and I never knew this, but foxes make a sound that sounds like a child crying very mm-hmm. loudly. 
loudly and it's incredibly creepy to hear that in the middle of the night even when you know it's just foxes because it sounds like somebody's baby is outside screaming yeah i've learned how uh awful and terrifying wildlife animals sound by playing red dead redemption <laughs> uh the witcher 3 you know you're like what is that whistling howling shriek oh it's a deer <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I, I used to go outside and walk late at night and I'd run into foxes sometimes. And at first I was terrified because I wasn't used to living in the middle of nowhere. And I thought seeing a fox meant I would get attacked by a fox. <laughs> I've been attacked by animals before. Mm-hmm. It's not the case. Geese. So. I, I, I was attacked by a swan once. No geese have harmed me. I have no gripes against the geese community. Swans can suck it. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of wildlife, we've seen some pretty disturbing stuff on planet Earth. One of your coworkers told me that. That you come into work all excited about whatever horrible thing you saw in a docu- nature documentary you're like get to work and be like oh i saw a polar bear get killed by a walrus last night <laughs> that, that sounds exactly like what josh does but since we've been on that nature documentary kick um i decided to take mandy to the minnesota zoo because she hasn't been there yet since she moved here what was your favorite animal at the zoo i liked the little dwarf crocodiles that were still baby sized and mm-hmm. then I'm never going to get any bigger. And I liked the prairie dogs because they were ridiculous. Yeah, prairie dogs are super fun to watch. And they have those um, Japanese snow monkeys. Hmm. Well, they've got probably like a dozen of them and they hang out. So they were great because snow monkeys naturally are supposed to guard water holes for only the higher ranking monkeys and nobody else can use them. And all the other snow monkeys were just playing and having fun and being normal. And there was one guy guarding a little pond all by himself himself like so vigilantly and he'd just be like sitting there not moving and then like he'd hear a noise or something like jerk up make sure nobody was gonna get in his way he was not letting anybody into that pond it, and- it's like that one mall cop who takes his job a little too seriously <laughs> but it was like it wasn't even the good because they have their like big rock formation and on top they have like their place where they hang out in the water but this mm-hmm. was like off to the side it was like a little puddly thing so it's like the one walmart security <laughs> yeah. guard who yeah. takes his job way too seriously. He's like, yeah, Tony, you got that. I got this. Don't worry about this hole. Right? <laughs> we saw a Tibetan wild dogs and some guy who worked at the zoo, like, walked past while we were watching them and they went Oh, they were crazy. the dolls, like, from, oh, yeah. from Far Cry. Yeah, yeah. Nice. They, they just went crazy thinking that guy had food and that they were going to get fed and they were acting just like puppies and it was super cute. Yeah, it was, it was crazy how, how they would act like domesticated dogs. Like, they see the guy coming and their ears perk up and they run over waiting for their food. Mm-hmm. I uh, there's a video floating around the YouTubes of some kids petting a monkey, probably a pet monkey, and they'll stop, and the monkey looks at him like, "What the fuck." Pats his back, like demanding more pets, and it's like a minute and a half of that, and like that that monkey really likes being pet. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a porcupine pufferfish, and it was my favorite because it had a little buck tooth, and he looked like such a little cartoon nerd. <laughs> If you follow me on Twitter, there's a picture of him on my Twitter somewhere in between all the pictures of the dumb video games I play. (laughs) Pictures of toilets. You know, while I was playing uh, Fallout New Vegas, because of you, Mandy, I looked in every building to make sure there was a bathroom and see how many toilets were in the bathroom. I haven't been playing games with toilets. I just platinumed Persona 4 dancing all night because I'm going crazy waiting for Persona 5. And that was fun, but there aren't there aren't a lot of toilets in rhythm action games. She she posited a theory on Twitter a while back, probably, what, a year ago? Yeah. That was uh, the sign of a quality game is that you'll find toilets in it. It's largely true. <laughs> Most of the best games of all time have toilets in them somewhere. Mm. Well, you know, I, I'm thinking to Skyrim and there's, in almost every fort, there's like this little section with a bucket and a book nearby. And if you think for a few moments, oh, that's the bathroom. So... yeah, It doesn't have to be a pristine toilet. It just a toilet in some form. And I think it's just because a lot of really good games will put in those little extra details. I like Fallout uh, toilets because you're never sure what's going to be in it. <laughs> Mini nuke. A teddy bear, you know what I mean? You can find a lot, of, a lot of books in toilets. Yeah, especially in Fallout 3. Book in bathroom? Sure. 
book in toilet? That's a little strange. Mm. You think it'd get waterlogged? They had radiation sickness and they were bored sitting over the toilet, so they were reading. But eventually, they dropped the book in. That's how it goes in the <laughs> wasteland. Fallout. I haven't played Fallout Four in a while, but I hear there's a survival mode. And Julian, you've been playing it a bit. How is it? It's great. I actually started a, a new game. I didn't pick up with my current character and turn on survival. I figured I'd start from scratch. And uh, it's one of those things where you know, I think when I originally played. I mean, I was just killing shit, racking up all this stuff, building, hoarding all these items. And now it's like, you know, you can only carry so much, so you really can't have every gun that you want. You have to have bullets, and they have a, a weight to them now. And you need food and water, and they have weight to them. And uh, the cool thing is, like, every time you're about to enter a building that you come across, you kind of take a second where you think, like, A, when was the last time I slept and saved? And am I going to be able to survive? I just, you know, I, I at one point I found a really cool um, revolver and it dawned on me that I hadn't slept and saved and I'm out in the middle of nowhere. I'm completely exposed and I don't want to lose this goddamn gun. <laughs> So what do I do? Well, I spend, you know, 25 minutes walking back to a bed that I know exists, you know. and <laughs> Well, that's how it happens. And not only a bed I know exists, but a good bed so I can get eight hours of sleep. And while I'm there, I can craft and, uh, you know, every battle is a, could be the end of the game, really, you know. No, I, I think I've talked about the Skyrim mods that add needs like that. And, yeah, you know, it drops you in the middle of something like, okay, uh, I need food. Shit, I don't have food. Well, I guess I'm spending an hour hunting a fucking deer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's cool? Is any empty, empty uh, bottle that you find now you can fill with dirty water and then you can purify that water. Oh, nice. Which is nice. Yeah, I haven't played Fallout 4 in a while, but I might have to check that out. But you have been playing another 4. Uh, yeah, I, I've been playing Uncharted 4. I actually completed it and I'm surprised at how little of the game was spoiled for me. Mm -hmm. There was like one small thing because I started reading a review and I was like, oh, son of a bitch. But then that thing ended up happening within the first hour of the game. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, cool. Was the um, G Deep section that they showed off extensively was that cool still were you really into it or was it like oh i the jeep section that they showed at e3 i wasn't sure how on rails it was mm -hmm. It's not at all. You're mm. driving that Jeep. Yeah. The paths that you go down are up to you, mm -hmm. but you've got this armored truck shooting at you. So if you go down the wrong path, it's going to catch up to you and you know, kill you. That was pretty far in the game, too. Yeah, it was pretty deep into the game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes they show you things and, you know, you like get to that point and you're kind of just like, Oh, okay. I know. I'll just get through this. And it's not as cool, you know, but uh, if it still has that impact, it's always good to hear. You can see how much they learned from making The Last of Us. And there's a lot more like emotional weight to the story once you get deeper in. Mm -hmm. And the like decaying buildings and stuff are Last of Us quality, you know, the crazy vegetation and all that. Mm -hmm. It was it was very good. I've, I've been playing the, the multiplayer though. And I really like the way they, they're handling multiplayer this, this round. Mm -hmm. All future maps and game modes are free for all players. There is a season pass, but it's a bunch of, <laughs> it's a bunch of like vanity items and like new character skins and stuff like that. And then a single player add on, hmm. which is the first single player add on in an um, uncharted game. Before the story, after the story, do we know? Oh, we don't know yet. Yeah. So here's my main question. How often do we get to see the thief's end? <laughs> Wasn't there a joke about that at some point? I hope so, because Nathan Drake is kind of hot. I did see there was a trophy on the level that they had demoed, and during the experience they had controller difficulties. So when the level starts, it's just sit Nathan sitting there for about 30 seconds. Yeah, no, that's what I thought of as soon as Josh played that. He's like, do you remember this? I'm like, yes, because I saw it four times in a row. <laughs> well, but if you actually let that mission start and you don't touch the controller for 30 seconds, you get a trophy. Oh, really? Yeah, that's basically harkens back to the... Oh, I like that. I can't remember what it's called, but it's like a plan where it's kind of... A, a bunch of good sports. Yeah. yeah, I gotta give them props for that. You know, they're like, hey, this happened. It no, was that's funny. awesome. Yeah. It's super good, and I, mm -hmm. I really, I really like Uncharted 4. And I, I've always liked the Uncharted games. This one is is very good. It's a yeah. worthy a worthy successor to the PS3 era Uncharted games. Mm. Amanda, you've been playing some anime baby making... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I, well, I, I, I finished Persona 4 Dancing All Night. I got every trophy. I did everything you can do in that game without spending a fortune on DLC. And I'll still play it more because I love Persona 4. But I really needed something to fill the void. And Persona 5 and Pokemon Sun and Moon are not out yet. And they're all I really want to play right now. Mm-hmm. So I bought a game called Conception 2 for $7 a couple weeks ago. And I'm like, well, I'll play this sometime when I don't know what to play. And so I started it up. And the premise of the game is that there are like dungeons that monsters come out of and they attack villages. And there are students who are trained to like become powerful enough to fight monsters. But this just started happening recently. So mm-hmm. nobody's really powerful enough to do much to fight them yet, except to keep them from enroaching on the main town. But then your character shows up and he has like all the MP in the world such an overload of MP that he can make magical anime babies with really strong girls. And this does not involve sexual content. They show what happens. What you do is you touch the hand of a girl and you use your spirit energy to make like a little tiny archer or swordsman or cleric or something. And then they go into the dungeons and fight monsters with you. Hmm. So it's not as bad as it sounds, but it goes out of its way to make you feel really uncomfortable with what you're playing all the time. Mm -hmm. I play it and I'm having fun and then like some people would be like go give nice presents to my mommy's daddy and I'm like ew I don't want to be playing this anymore but unless unless Atlas decides to release Persona 5 here before Japan there's no saving me. I'm gonna admit I want to play it. I hate myself for wanting to play that game so much but I want to play it. I mean I'll probably platinum it so. (laughs) Because, you know, I, I have a well-documented Magical Girl thing. Yeah, they have Magical Girl they, transformation sequences in it. That is why. So I think uh, this is a good time. I'm going to call a break. I'd like to thank 2XAA and Wheelie for their uh, continued service. At ease, soldier. The war is over. I'd like to thank uh, Aaron Voltenson, uh for the graphics design. Uh, we are on RetroEvolve.com, you know, HalfGlassGaming.com, iTunes, Stitcher. Um, we are all over the place. I think we were even on the uh, bulletin board at your local Cub Food. When we come back from the break, uh, we're going to have a message for everybody. Break time. All right. Well, we're uh, we're back from the break, and um, as I'm sure uh, most of you know by now, Jimmy, brace yourself. This is the final episode of Half Glass Gaming. The network came down on us, and they canceled us. Tried adding Raven Simone, didn't work. <laughs> uh, so here we are, packing our things, yeah. carrying our gun and badges. So I'm gonna admit to some behind the scenes stuff. I have documented and severe mental health issues. I've made mention to my depression and anxiety uh, and my ADHD in the past. Uh, and one of the things that happens when I start having more issues, when it starts getting worse, and, you know, I, I go to the doctor, I take my meds like I'm supposed to, so don't don't worry too much about me, but... I have a hard time getting out and doing stuff and spending time with people. And the longer I go without spending time with people, the more I start to kind of dwindle downward and my brain starts telling me no one really likes me because if they liked me, they would get in contact with me and they'd want to, they'd want to hang out with me and they don't. And so anytime I'm around someone, it's just an imposition and it's causing problems. And then the only times I've managed to hang out with Josh and Mandy of recent, and this is not their fault, you know, Josh is busy, he's got a full-time job, he's got a second full-time job in editing this podcast, like, you know, Mandy worked, like, life happens, I'm not blaming anyone, but the only time I really managed to hang out with them is when we're doing the podcast, and so because it's a thing where we're, like, obligated, my brain starts telling me how no one really wants to do it, and I'm forcing them to do it, and then it continues to go downward. So last, uh, when we were supposed to record, 
uh, I was building up to quite a panic attack and kind of messaged Josh and saying, I, I just, I don't think I can do this. That was when he said, you know, really, this is taking a lot of my time and I don't have time for anything else. So if you guys are okay with it, I'm okay with just quitting. And so that's that's kind of what happened here on my end. It's not that I don't like doing the podcast. I enjoy doing it. Uh, I always enjoy taking the opportunity to talk and pretend that people like hearing what I say. Just shit happens, life happens, and sometimes you gotta go, this isn't working as well as I would like. But, you know, you can still uh, get in contact with all of us on Twitter. I post our Twitter accounts on every episode, and so, you know, you can still contact us on those places, and, you know, if you want to chat about video games, like, hit us up, and we'll talk about video games. Um... There's going to be content on Retrovolve that, you know, the four of us will be writing, maybe some other people as well. But for me, the whole half glass gaming thing, when the Rev came to me, I had been wrestling with this for a while because I'm um, focusing really hard on my writing right now. And I'm trying to publish some things and yada, yada, yada. But um, this podcast is a ton of work. I'm kind of obsessive and we do a lot of work that isn't normal for a podcast uh, to maintain the high level of quality that we have. For example, when I'm going back and editing every episode, instead of just leaving two hours of us talking about games, you know, no matter what we say, I cut a lot of stuff out that's not helpful, that's not leading to an interesting, entertaining, and informative conversation. A lot of what ends up happening is I'll go back and someone will say something and I'll be like, like, wait, that thing that that person said, I don't know if that's true or not. And so then I fact check. And then a lot of times we'll end up re-recording that segment because the information was bad. And I I know we we got busted <laughs> one time on having some information that wasn't that wasn't factually accurate. But for the most part, I mean, we've been, you know, very very accurate, very uh, committed to telling people the truth. Uh, Mandy does a ton of research every single week to, you know, make sure we've got a lot of interesting things to talk about that that people don't necessarily know already. If it's like hard facts, Mandy almost certainly looked it up and just told us the information and then let us say it. No, I read through core documents from the 80s so you guys don't have to. Uh, yeah, Mandy does a lot, almost all of the research work for this podcast. You know, between me and Mandy, I mean, I know I put at least 15 hours a week into the podcast every single week, and I could do less than that, but... No, you couldn't. Like, that that's the thing. No, you like, you could do less than that, but no, you couldn't. Right. It would lead to, it would lead to a lower quality product. And I, I'm very proud of the 45 episodes we put out. For anyone who hasn't listened to all 45, you know, they're still going to be up. You can go back and listen to any that you have missed. Hopefully catch up, you know, hopefully take a second listen through if, if you ha- have that little half glass gaming shaped hole in your heart. Our listeners are so loyal that I didn't want to have to shut it down because we really do appreciate all of the people who listen every week and comment every week. And because we've got analytics data, I know we've got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of listeners who aren't commenting and are just kind of sitting in the background and and listening. And that's fine. That's, That's a perfectly legit way to enjoy the podcast. But for all of the people that make it a point to listen to the podcast every single week, you know, I do feel genuinely bad because I know it's a thing you guys love and I don't want to have to take it away. I don't want to have to shut it down. But at this point in my life and, you know, in the Rev's life and in Mandy's life 
And, you know, even Julian a little bit. I know you're focusing really hard, Julian, on your music right now. And um, that's cool. Like, we've all got other things that I think we've been putting aside for this podcast. And having the freedom to go finally focus on those things is going to be good and healthy for all four of us. Well, I think when it comes down to it, I had to do very little for this podcast. I show up. I talk. I look at my notes from Mandy. And then I go home. So when, you know... Three-fourths of the podcast, uh, for whatever reason, need to shut it down. Big Dog uh, takes off his talky voice, hangs it up, and uh, turns off the light. I birthed uh, Half Glass Gaming as a title, and uh, I wore it proudly when I went to the market. And, uh, you know, look, it's been a good time. We appreciate the listens. You know, we're out there still if you really want to get out and chat or connect with us and uh look it's been great we've done some great things we've had a strong run we've had an impressive 45 in a row you know some people can't say that uh some some podcasts have not quite 45 episodes over five years you know (laughs) some guys tell guys stuff and they don't have the time to really put in the effort that we do they don't care enough um i said it um so you know hey look that's it um, so I think, uh, we're going to take another break. This will be the last break that we ever take. So we're going to make it a great break. And when we come back, stuff. So we're back from the break, and uh, look, you've already taken a peek behind the curtain, but I hear there's some um, interesting Witcher 3 things on Twitter. PC Gamer, the website, they've been posting a lot of Witcher 3 stories because the second expansion is coming out at the end of May, and every single time they post a new news story on Twitter, they use the image of Geralt with his legs spread in the in the tub. And he's totally naked. Ah! And you kind of have like, they don't show anything, but really all that's covered up is the parts they have to cover up, which is in the water. And and you're imagining it. You see it in your head. I mean, you're, you're looking at him from the bottom of his feet. And they they use this image every time they post a new Witcher 3 story, and people are furious. Yeah, fuck them. This makes me so happy. They're like, you know, there's other Witcher 3 images you could be using, and like, you know, other people are like, ah, oh, I think I'm going to block this account on my Twitter. Yeah, but how often do they this. use pictures of tits for other games? Fuck you guys. Cock bulge all the way. <laughs> It, it, it makes this podcast circular because we began talking about uh, Geralt's genitalia. We did. And Witcher 3 cock bulge. <laughs> here we are talking about Witcher 3 cock bulge. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag Witcher 3 cock bulge. <laughs> I've been I've been really enjoying the Geralt bathtub picture. Speaking of hashtag Witcher 3 cock bulge. What I always find really hilarious and also really obnoxious in equal parts is when companies try to use hashtags to market when they really don't know what they should be doing with those hashtags. Like the hashtag is trending, so they try to use it. It's like, no, no, don't, don't use that hashtag because like advertising is fine. That's what Twitter is for to some extent. But DiGiorno's should not be using a hashtag that talks about, you know, domestic abuse or whatever, which is a thing that happened. DiGiorno's tried to hop on a trending hashtag that was being used for domestic abuse for advertising. And like, you know, there are better ways to advertise. In the Pokemon Twitter, the official one, they uh, recently announced the starters for the upcoming Pokemon that's out this year. And they put up a poll for the best Pokemon and everybody is hating on the poor water Pokemon. And I'm really bummed out about that. I get sad every time I look at my Twitter. See, that that makes me like... I'm a grass starter type all the way, and Bulbasaur, uh, Chikorita, on and on. But that seal is adorable. It does not deserve the hate it's getting on the internet. There's some uh, very negative uh, blowback to the uh, new Call of Duty trailer that's kind of all over the uh, YouTube page for it. Uh, 
I read on Forbes, I don't know how accurate this is, but they claimed that the new Call of Duty trailer is the most disliked game trailer in YouTube history. Mm -hmm. Well, the Battlefield 1 trailer, which is Call of Duty's big competition this year, is the most liked Hmm. of all time. I can see it as being the most disliked. Um, There are a lot of thumbs pointed downward for that video. Even more so than the trailer for the the new Ghostbusters movie, which was (laughs) getting some pretty negative responses as well. But as far as the most liked video, I I mean, I guess. I I don't know. I don't like the... I don't like either trailer, to be honest with you. I think I'm done with Call of Duty at this point. I've played almost every one since the very beginning. I'm tired of it. They're not doing anything interesting or new. Mm -hmm. Uh, Battlefield is like, you know... You know what we haven't done to death in the games industry and in the first person shooter industry is World War One. Yeah. You know, let's get some horseback combat. Let's get some biplane dogfight combat mm-hmm. going on. And we'll you know, let's throw in some big dirigibles like Yeah. See, it, that's that's yeah. what gets me about a lot of these uh, FPSs recently. Like, there are so many different wars throughout human history. Why not use more of them? You know, World War One is is when warfare changed on like a a global scale. There's a reason they call it World War One. You know, there's and and it feels like all we see is World War Two or sci-fi shooting. Well, even World War Two, we haven't seen. I mean, with the exception of like Wolfenstein, yeah. we've like it's not really being tapped into anymore. Any, even that, I mean, that's like sci-fi take right. on World War Two. You know. I mean, the first Black Ops did the Cold War, which was really interesting because it was like something that you could feel fresh for a first-person I, shooter. I explain that because the point of the Cold War was that no actual war was happening. That's why they called it the Cold War. Right. I mean, Black Ops was about like espionage and stuff like that. Okay. That that actually does sound legitimately interesting as far as FPSs go. I mean, it, yeah, it was a first person shooter with with combat, what, right, whatever. Of course, but but the idea of the story was about espionage. Okay. And it was about basically brainwashing soldiers and and things like that. It was really interesting. That mm-hmm. sound like I'm not big on F, like first person anything. I've said that multiple times, but. I'll play a first-person game if it has an interesting premise, and that sounds legitimately interesting. Well, sidestepping more in-depth studies of uh, Call of Duty, I think uh, to get back to the ad for the uh, recent one and its negative impact, um, I kind of wonder what were early video game ads like? Video game ads didn't exist at all until the 70s, and at that point in time, I don't think people really knew how to advertise them. They were just like, wow, there's this thing. It's Mm -hmm. exciting. And I mean, it was at the time. It wasn't around then, but I'm sure it was. I did. I had a Magnavax Odyssey 2 as a kid. Mm -hmm. It's older than me, but, you know, I had it in my house. I remember a few Atari television commercials, which of like a Star Wars game where a guy put it in and he was just, whoa, whoa. Yeah, we had that on the podcast. Oh, yeah, we did, didn't we? Yeah. Well, that's probably one of the challenges is that the games, if you play them, maybe it blows your mind. But if you're just some random I mean, person, I don't know that some of that stuff didn't look impressive. Well, maybe fine. not. But I think sure. For its time, yeah. But, I mean, like a lot of those ads focused on how much enjoyment the person playing the game in the ad was having. Sure. And, how that can kind of equate to your real life, you know, it wasn't just like, I, I mean, Pitfall Harry, they don't have like tense music as he's swinging over the pit and, you know. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't do the kind of cinematic ads that are really common now. You had to sort of create a story behind the ad and that led to some really weird ads. Like mm-hmm. there's that famous Zelda ad where it's just sort of some guy yelling weird things that are vaguely related to Zelda I think he wears all black, and they show, like, shots from the game, and then he's like, Zelda! Yeah. <laughs> and, like, his Fred Flintstone voice. It's yeah. it's very disorienting. His rendition but of they a didn't, street car I don't desire. think anybody knew what they were doing. This was a brand new thing. They were just guessing, and games were selling yeah. insanely well at the beginning, so they didn't have to try too hard. Well, it might, it might have been difficult to pick a winner, really, to know what to really get behind. I mean... 
now, yeah, Call of Duty. We'll make a goddamn trailer because we're going to sell, you know, infinite numbers of those games. But back then, I mean, I don't know. Defender, what the hell was that? Well, and then, of course, you know, there was the video game crash and Nintendo came around and went, well, we have to market this as a toy because nobody's going to buy a video game. So, you know, I'm, the ads for Atari stuff was talking like all ages, enjoyment, excitement, and then... When Nintendo came around, it was more toy commercial. Yeah, I recall uh, a Legend of Zelda commercial or where there was, you know, the kid in the leather jacket and then the nerd kid. And they were both in like, that was to my age at the time because that was what they were selling. Mm -hmm. So, like, there was a very clear change or shift in how game advertising worked there, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, the video game crash happened around the same time that regulations regarding commercials aimed at kids were changed. Commercial mm. television was completely deregulated and then people could create entire cartoons that were essentially advertisements and it was completely legal, mm. which it wasn't before the 80s. Way to go 80s. Right. So with the uh, deregulation, um, I mean, what does that really open up the window to, uh, you know, Sonic cartoons or, I mean, what are well, we talking about? Well, that was about? part of it. And I think most of us remember the Nintendo themed cartoons mm -hmm. that aired in the 80s. But uh, the biggest change was that video games were marketed to everybody before the crash. And after this happened and after they were able to hyper focus on children's advertising, uh, video game advertising became very gendered. And this wasn't just video games. This was all toy advertising in the 80s. Mm -hmm. There was a significantly higher gender split in all toy advertising. The 80s were when they started to have pink aisles and blue aisles in the toy stores. Mm -hmm. um, even now, mm -hmm. uh, advertising is far more gendered than it was in the 70s and even a large portion of the 60s. Hmm. That was the idea is video games went from being toys for everybody to being toys for boys. And I don't think that it necessarily hit even when I was in elementary school because I just remember everybody played video games. But yeah. by the time I got to middle school and high school, it seemed like a strange thing that I was super into video games and I mean everybody had grown up with a Nintendo in their house so this was entirely mm -hmm. this is a view entirely constructed by advertising and just constantly only showing boys in video game ads and constantly belittling females in yeah. video game ads yeah I think that's how I grew up you know um, under the impression that it was a boys thing and you know anything TV or movies you see in arcade and you know it's just a bunch of street tough dudes and maybe one loose woman um, but uh, typically, yeah, I mean, I don't even think, now that I'm looking back on it, that I would even have considered girls playing games until all oh, those Barbie games came out, or, you know. I recall feeling like console stuff, like Nintendo or Sega, was boy-related, but I'm remembering PC games, like the Tandy PC, etc., would always have like do the standard multicultural type ad you know you'd always see a group of kids with boys and girls and like the one black kid or whatever and I mean, i'm sure that was true for edutainment games um i would say actually the thing that got the most female oriented advertising in the 80s and 90s was the game boy which coincidentally also had a very high female install base I they mean, not coincidental. Then. Well, it's released, almost uh, certainly directly because of that. They should have released uh, Game Girl. Well, and uh, and I do remember feeling like when I was a child, I had a Nintendo and then a Super Nintendo, and I absolutely did not have a computer that played computer games. But I do recall feeling as though, oh, well, the PCs just have a bunch of education games. So... That that does speak to the idea that, you know, that was what they did with edutainment games. Mm -hmm. Well, now, and as a uh, video game uh, magazine aficionado, Mandy, um, what were the ads like in, like, a Nintendo Power? Did they differ from what you would see on television? Or no, I mean, those ads, a lot of those ads were weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of language that didn't really mean anything that was designed to appeal specifically to gamers. Like, a lot of the ads, especially from the early 90s, you'll 
will I see them like list the number of polygons or like they'll come up with some kind of number to list that doesn't actually have any impact on the game's performance at all. And like they were like numbers, big numbers, make your games better. Mm -hmm. And there were just a lot of bizarre advertising campaigns that I don't think would have flown anywhere else. And sometimes they didn't. Like uh, there were the really weird Raymond ads where Raymond was at a urinal. <laughs> and the joke was like about Raymond's hands and how he would pee. And I mean, how could you get away with that anywhere but a magazine and yeah, the kids and teenagers? I mean, they probably didn't get away with it, all of them. I'm, I'm wondering less about his hands and... Uh... <laughs> I, um, I mean, I never Ray, wanted to think about Raymond's genitalia ever. And Rayman so, cockbulge. Not, I, not a thing I want in the world. Uh, I'm remembering comic style ads for the Turbo Graphic 16, where they had like a military guy throwing grenades and blowing shit up, and then saying the Turbo Graphics is the only true 16-bit system. These others use like 8-bit processors or something. You know, what, whatever thing yeah, that they... I mean, comic style ads weren't exclusive to video games. So ex- well, sure. They said for a very long time. I like hostess know, fruit pies. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going <laughs> to say. If you've ever read a really old comic book, you've seen a bunch of fake comic ads. But, uh, but it's mostly like the military guy throwing grenades and blowing up people who were playing Super Nintendo or whatever. And uh, <laughs> later in the mid-90s and on, they started to do a lot of ads that faked being content in the magazine and they just had advertisement and time tiny letters near mm. the top or the bottom. Mm. Like, you'd pick it up and they'd be like, oh, here's a 10-page special on this game you don't care about at all. And you'd be like, this is a lot of boring content about how great this stupid Oceans licensed game is. To go back to an earlier comment about the television shows and cartoons that were essentially advertisements, I feel like those worked really well. Like, this... I know Captain Lou Albano from as Mario from the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, and I'm a professional wrestler who studies the history of the industry. I should know him as a professional wrestler. I know almost nothing about his wrestling history. Mm-hmm. He's fucking Mario. See, I always identify him as being uh, Cindy Lauper's father. Uh, or that. That works, too. That's the way I like to remember him. Rest in peace. Right? Uh, but, like, that, that's how well it worked. You know, like, there was also a series of choose-your-own-adventure books that I still remember buying every single one and waiting with bated breath for the next, in, like, the next number in the choose-your-own-adventure Super Mario Brothers or Legend of Zelda book. You know, and I, like, my two favorite, of course, was there was one that focused on Luigi and he was the one who was having the adventure. And then there was another one that had Zelda and she was the one who was having the adventure because that's who the fuck I am. But like that's that's what they started doing to get pe- kids interested in these video games. You know, they had all these other media. Mm-hmm. And I don't like it's interesting that these other media were genuinely good in their own way. Except the Legend of Zelda cartoon, which was not, and like it's, I, it's still kind of fun it, to watch. It's it. fun. It's fun. It's a fun cartoon. I wouldn't say it's a good cartoon. You're not gonna like feel spiritually or right. or uh, philosophically enhanced by watching it, right? But you're gonna have a um, you, you're gonna find it fun, mm. or or Captain and the Game Master. So has there ever been in the history of mankind? A video game ad that was too extreme and was banned. Uh, That happened a lot. And you see all the time these obnoxious articles that are like, oh, 10 hardcore video game ads that would be banned today. Mm -hmm. But most of those ads did get banned back then. The ads that really pushed buttons. Mm -hmm. I mean, they would get pulled from magazines. There's one that Josh and I did to think about on Retrovolve where they tried to advertise the Game Boy by having a girl tied up to a bed. In a creepy room, looking really upset, and I mean, they, they, that was not—they were not going for how it came across, but they got just tons of letters complaining, and had to pull it. Yeah, when you first look at the picture, it's like kind of disturbing, and it's you know a woman in like a nighty thing, like 
tied it to a bed and the it's like the game boy seriously distracting and the guy's like ignoring her and playing game boy and it's like what scene am i walking in on in so this ad here it takes the time to intrude this woman's home ties her up well you can tell that it's not her home Either i mean worse. So it's, it's very a woman it's right. That's what it, it looks feels like, like it feels no very point. kidnappy. I don't even think there are sheets on the mattress. No, there's not. So yeah. that just makes the whole thing look really weird. And mm-hmm. like she very obviously did not tie herself to that bed in that picture. It's just like the advertisers didn't think anything through. Yeah. You know, if they had thought for like five minutes and instead of having her look upset, have her look annoyed I was just and put that. like some whips and and uh a horse buggy whips and whatever on the wall it still would have been disturbing and nobody would have wanted it, but at least it wouldn't have had that really creepy well, overtone. That's what, that was the thing. Is that <laughs> they, they tried to... They wanted this woman looking annoyed that she had been forgotten, not, you know, oh, dear God, help me. But the look <laughs> on her face is very hard. It's very ambiguous. It's very hard to interpret. But they did... Like, the same ad agency that did that ad did another ad, you know, several years later that had, you know, a couple in bed and the woman's like has her arm around the guy and the guy's just playing Game Boy and kind of ignoring her. And that was like the same idea mm-hmm. that they had tried to get at with the first ad. Yeah, but it's like, expressed in a reasonable more Right. It doesn't have all the weird kidnappy stuff. Like Yeah. That's bizarre. No, and uh, T V commercials would get pulled too. There is a ad for Ocarina of Time where this guy is giving you all these challenges and this dramatic voice and it originally ended with well, with uh, will Thou save the girl or play like one and that got pulled and recut and changed to something that didn't alienate a large portion of the game buying audience I mean I think most people probably didn't even, wouldn't have never even seen the original version of the ad except that some people taped it and it was on YouTube mm. but it happened all the time uh GamePro did a piece probably about 10 years ago talking about all the ads that they had to pull. They said the ad that they got the most complaints about was that there was an ad for the Sega Saturn where they had a centerfold of a naked woman and then they put screenshots for Saturn games over the bits that you could only show in a porn magazine. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, I've seen and that, that, that got banned and they said that's the most complaints they've ever gotten. They got like significant amount of cancelled subscriptions because you know most of the people buy game pro we're like mm-hmm. moms who got the subscription for their kids how well they probably canceled the subscription because they covered up the breasts yeah. so. but, sorry I like don't I don't, i'm not going to support censorship in my games <laughs> you show those boobs <laughs> I, I know which magazines i can subscribe to where that won't be covered up But the idea that anything went in game advertising back in the day and now things are really restrictive is not true. I would say people were testing the waters more and they realized a bunch of that stuff would get pulled and banned and so they don't waste their money on it as Mm -hmm. often anymore because it is a waste to spend a lot of money in an ad that you have to pull. Yeah. And and it isn't like they don't make ads that test the limits these days. I mean, if there's uh, there's one ad that immediately leaps to mind uh, that you can find if you look for it on YouTube. It's a Skittles ad that it shows a man and his wife are clearly having sex. And when he comes, he comes Skittles all over her face. They made and, like, they wrote and blocked and filmed that. That wasn't going to be on TV. Mm. (laughs) So, like, it's not like they don't do that shit now, too. (laughs) That's true. That is true. But nowadays, I think you run into issues, um, perhaps not with necessarily um, ill-begot or uh, poorly conceived game ads so much as almost like deceptive game ads yeah and i think there's a really cinematic approach to game Very editing much so, that, yeah. in my mind that really started with final fantasy 7 like that was the game with the huge television push based entirely on graphics mm-hmm. and was saying like look at this it looks like a movie and i mean it did to me back in 1997 for sure yeah i think for me, what comes to mind, obviously, is the infamous Dead Island trailer. 
Yeah. That it was night and day compared to what you That's were actually... That's the thing. Is Final Fantasy VII was saying, look at how cool this looks with, you know, cutscenes that were really in the game. And then some advertisers were like, oh, we can create something really cool and cinematic. Mm-hmm. And, this, you know, some of them use stuff from the game and some of them make stuff up. There's, um, and this is a great ad, but there's an ad for Golden Sun that's insane and cinematic and it has like a giant crystal dragon coming to life. And, None of it has anything to do with the game. They yeah. just made the most cinematic, cinematic ad possible. Mm-hmm. And it looks really cool, but if anybody bought the game expecting to fight crystal dragons, you know, they would be very disappointed. It's nothing like it, yeah. even slightly. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, even like the uh, original Gears of War ad with um, that Mad World song in the trailer. The Gary Jules version. Yeah, it kind of painted this picture of like this hopeless sort of dour world uh where you're fighting like enormous monsters and god help you and uh you know then the game comes out and for me i was kind of just like oh okay it's just it's just another game gore fest yeah chainsawing aliens in a house yeah you know like (laughs) Where's like who who would put a chainsaw on a gun? It's like instead of a bayonet, it's like well, we've got a gun and a chainsaw. Well, and like how much gas could you fit on that thing? <laughs> you know, like you'd only probably be able to use it for like five minutes. <laughs> but five minutes is all you need, and then you're done. You know, at least a bayonet you can stab the shit out of people endlessly. <laughs> I mean, uh, like the the Gears of War guys are so bulky and then they're wearing armor yeah. that they like they actually move like Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this really dark like supposed to be kind of serious game and then everyone moves like Buzz Lightyear and it's oh, always yeah. been hilarious and, to like, me. And like the dodge roll or whatever. <laughs> right? Is. It's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> all right, I suppose It's so. like that guy with all that muscle weighs 500 pounds mm-hmm. and then he's got like armor that probably weighs another 200 pounds. Like, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. Now, was it was it a trailer um, for Alien Colonial Marines that kind of... I mean, everything for Alien Colonial <laughs> Marines. They had people, like, playing demos that I believe yeah. were not the actual game Yeah, they had, they had fabricated a game yeah. demo. Yeah. That was that was the thing that, that got the, the most ire from games because journalists. Because people did previews that talked about the game playing well, so people might have pre-ordered it because they heard all this mm-hmm. great and stuff, and that wasn't real at all. I mean, and that's not all they faked. That's just probably the thing that caused the biggest problem, is that they actually faked a demo. Yeah, I heard all sorts of well, stories. We had good times. Although, yeah. Yeah, Mandy and I have played all the way through Colonial Marines. We've, we've and... even played the DLC additional story. Wow. And, yeah. Does anybody have any favorite uh, gaming ads? I always really liked the ad for the first Smash Brothers, the TV one. Okay. I didn't have a TV for almost my entire childhood, and I think that probably hit right around the time I finally had a working TV that could do more than play video games and VHS tapes. <laughs> in my house and that was the one that i remember getting really excited every time it came on that's it's uh for those of you who don't remember it's just a bunch of guys in uh it's a live action trailer with a bunch of guys in character costumes just beating on each other as happy together plays (laughs) that was very very funny to young me Hmm. but uh i mean i think i would have bought smash brothers regardless it's rare that i would say i my purchases are super influenced by advertising not because i'm not susceptible to advertising but because i always obsessively kept up with the video games media Mm -hmm. and so i already knew about everything i mean that i guess i was more likely to buy something because of a preview in a video game magazine than because of an ad yeah i agree with that yeah i I don't think there's ever been a time when i've seen an ad and i thought okay yeah i need that game no there's one there's one for me and this came People, most people are not as much of a weeb as I am, so they probably don't know this, but there are anime magazines that come with DVDs that have episodes of anime on them for you to watch when Hmm. you buy the magazine. And one of those old New Type, New Type was the magazine that did that, one of those old magazine issues had um, a commercial for the first Disgaea, and it played uh, Enemy Inside of Me by Tsunami Bomb, and it just showed a bunch of Disgaea stuff, and nobody was covering Disgaea. Mm Mm-hmm. 
at the time. And I mean, it was just insane. And like, I wanted to go out and look for the game that night and I couldn't even find out if it had come out yet. And I mean, Disgaea is one of my favorite franchises of all time. So it was a good buy. That was, that was the one ad that really got me. You know what? You, Josh, you got one? No, I really liked the, uh, the Michael ad that PlayStation ran where it was, a bunch of PlayStation characters sitting around in a pub, like talking about like, oh, I was pinned down and blah blah blah, and it would never gotten out, but Michael helped me, and it was like Michael was basically the the player. Mm-hmm. I mean, Michael is statistically the most likely ga- name for a video game playing person to have because it is <laughs> at least in the U.S. because it is the most common name in the United States. Is it? I did not know that. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So you have you know. Hundreds of thousands of Michaels watching the ad and being like, it was me. me. (laughs) Yeah, I think, um, you know, if you're like me, you just kind of like a good trailer, you know. Sometimes uh, that could be a a developer diary or, um, you know, a nice little teaser or uh, it's hard to say, really. I think we all know, you know, bad when, when we see one. Yeah, it's, I don't know. I think at this point, really, you know, who cares? Thanks for joining us, Half Glass Gaming. We're out. <laughs> you're, you're not, you're not gonna wax poetically or we're pontificate. Dead. We already uh-huh. did. Uh, I suppose. A different flavor of Snapple today. I noticed that. I don't like it. It's all right. No Snapple apple. It's no Snapple apple. That that's weird. You're weird. Don't do that. Josh has a new flavor of Snapple, and my world is changing, and I don't like it. It's not appropriate. You should know better. Well, just like the podcast, you retired Snapple apple. <laughs>